Welcome to In The Mix. I'm Abby Brody. When we're in the mix, we're having real conversations about higher education. Higher education is rapidly changing and it needs to, to meet the demands of today and tomorrow. This is a conversation we all need to be a part of. So come join us as we get into the mix. Hello and welcome back. I'm Abby Brody and you're in the mix. Today, we have a really inspiring guest. This is the one and only Neil Blumenthal. He is the co-founder and co-CEO of Warby Parker. That is more than an eyewear brand. It is a mission to make impact in the world and it's living it. They have already distributed through their buy a pair, give a pair program, eight million eyewear glasses for people in need, giving them what I would say is a basic human right, the right to see. And it makes for all about exploration and seeing is an integral part of that. Neil doesn't just stop there. He serves on multiple boards and continues to give back to this passion of helping people have this basic human right. I would be remiss though to not talk about some of my favorite people in his life. His wife, Rachel, is an incredible entrepreneur herself, the CEO and founder of Rockets of Awesome. And he has two incredible children that I'm lucky enough to have my own children be friends with. So without further ado, I want to introduce Neil, an incredible, inspiring entrepreneur who is making impact in the world and also an incredible father and friend. Welcome, Neil. Thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you. So Neil, you know that the mix is all about bringing education to the 21st century and thinking beyond the traditional confines. But you've been blessed to have a pretty incredible education experience um, that probably plays a big role in who you are today. So if you could just start by reflecting on your education and how you think that brought you to where you are today. Definitely. Well, I grew up in New York City and went to Friends Seminary, uh, which is a school really steeped in values around community and giving back. And there's no doubt that that had a profound impact on my professional journey. Um, after graduating high school from Friends, I went to Tufts in Boston and studied international relations. And I think that gave me um, a very global view. And when I was at Tufts getting my bachelor's, I studied abroad in Madrid and in Buenos Aires. And just being and living in other parts of the world also broadens one's perspective. Um, after graduating from Tufts, I actually went to The Hague and did a graduate program on international mediation and conflict resolution. Um, I was very passionate about how countries interacted with one another and thought if we could get countries to stop fighting wars and killing each other, then we could focus on the big things like health and education. Um, and uh, ended up working at a think tank, but uh, met an amazing eye doctor who had this nonprofit to provide glasses to people in need around the world and learned a ton there and actually went back to school, to graduate school to get my MBA from the Wharton School. And I think that helped provide a technical foundation for running a business. And it was actually at Wharton that I met my co-founders and we started Warby Parker um, while at school. The, now, this is fascinating. So you were able, because this is something we're really passionate about, Mix. One of the things we're really concerned about is that school is often in this bubble, right? You're doing tests, you're doing papers, you're check, 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 check. But you don't know if what you're doing applies to the real world, and you don't usually get those opportunities till after school. So you had this unique school and life being together. Definitely. You know, it's funny. Professionally, people talk a lot about work-life balance. Um, and right, we think a lot about work-life integration. And I think it's the same with school. And that's why I'm so excited uh, about what you're building at in the mix is just how right we can couple these experiences and help people grow. And what we did at Warby Parker was the four of us sort of had this idea, right? Glasses are just way too expensive. Um, and you know this personally, I'm assuming. Yeah. 
Personal project, yeah. One of my co-founders, Dave, lost a pair of $700 glasses in the seat pocket of an airplane. Um, as a full-time student, he wasn't about to replace those anytime soon. Our other co-founder, Andy, was thinking about how come nobody was selling glasses online. Um, Jeff, similarly, had an old pair of glasses that needed to be replaced, and nobody wanted to go spend five, six hundred, seven hundred dollars $700. Uh, so we thought, well, what if we sold glasses for $95, um, but we're able to do so by going direct to consumer online. And I remember the first conversation that we had so vividly because it was in the sort of hallway and we had to cut the conversation short because we had to run off for class. And then later in the day, we sort of reconnected, talked about it a little bit. Um, but, you know, later in that night, sort of I was up and I couldn't sleep because you know when you have an idea and it's just racing through your head. So I emailed, you know, uh, Jeff, Andy and Dave, I think it was probably like two in the morning or something. And then at 201, Andy res responded and Dave responded and Jeff responded because they were all up also thinking about the idea. So um, what we then did was enroll in a class where the one output was a business plan. We figured, hey, we're going to write a business plan <laughs> anyway to potentially start this business. We might as well get class credit for it. Um, and it was amazing being at school with this idea in our minds because it made every class at Wharton that much more real, right? When we were taking a class on operations or supply chain or a finance class, right? We were thinking about how does this relate to what would be Warby Parker? That is so, that is incredible. So, you know, one of the things we know is that students who have understand the why, like, why am I taking operations? If you have something to really sink your teeth in, it has so much, your ability to master that content just so much stronger because you have real reason. I, I have to ask out of curiosity, how did you do in that class? What did you get? <laughs> um, I, I think we all got A's, but to be honest, what was great about Wharton was that there was great non-disclosure. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I don't remember. The most important thing is that I graduated. Yes, but they agree uh, this was a good idea. It's always yeah. interesting to see, because so, you hear these stories sometimes where they have an idea in business school and the professor's just like, no, never going to make it. But yeah. <laughs> The most amazing thing is that we entered into this business comp plan competition and we lost to our good friend, Joey Zwillinger, who ended up going on to start Allbirds. But he had this terrible idea about cuddle bots. They were like these stuffed animals that were also educational tools or something. And we couldn't believe that we lost to him. Um, but I yeah. bet he couldn't believe it either. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I want a cuddle bot. That actually frightens me as a parent. Right, that, right. This like bot cuddling my child, but who knows? Who knows? So, you know, as you think about now you're on the other side there's so many people looking to you to understand like you know warby parker is growing you know you're in a growth stage and you must be looking at hiring and bringing in this young talent what are you looking for in when you're looking at people coming in entry-level jobs what type of education are you looking for what advice do you have for people who are trying to figure out their next steps yeah so more than education i look for a few attributes like is this person proactive um, are they a self-starter um, are they do their values align with the values of the company um, and you know sometimes we're able to deduce that from someone's educational background but on more traditional educational paths you know I'm not sure that we're teaching kids to be proactive and you know, not only identify problems, but think about the solutions and then taking the first step to resolve those. And that's what I need at Warby Parker. We have about 3000 people across the US and, and Canada. And right, what I need is every single day, people to wake up and think about, hey, how am I gonna improve the life of our stakeholders, right? Whether it's a coworker, whether it's a customer, uh, whether it's a community at, at large, um, and that really requires people to be sort of proactive. And how do you think, so you clearly are proactive. Where do you think you get that? How does someone become proactive? Do you think it was from going abroad and seeing the rest of the world? Like what part of your journey do you think gave you that skill set that you think others could use? 
Yeah, I think there's a certain amount of independence that you gain through like study abroad programs, for example, where you're out of your comfort zone um, and you have to quickly learn to adapt and, and, and function. Um, and that then translates, I think, to being, you know, proactive in, in the future. You know, I look and I think about some of the traditional forms of education where everybody is sitting in these sort of industrial desks in, in rows um, and, you know, the learning is very rote um, and everything is very prescriptive and you get rewarded and high grades if you do exactly what the teacher asks. Well, we're moving too quickly as a company for everyone who's a people manager at Warby Parker to tell all of their direct reports exactly what that person needs to do every day, mm -hmm. right? To your point, you teach somebody the why, right? And they can go and, and solve that. And that's what we're trying to do at, at Warby. So true. So true. You know, and, you know, thinking back uh, on my own experiences, you know, I only got to really, we have the saying that I say a lot, you can't be found unless you get lost. Sometimes you have to like get outside, explore a little bit. Now, what I'd love to talk about is something that you've done so beautifully and something really passionate to our core mix. It's uniting your passions with what the world needs, right? A lot of kids come to us and say, oh, I'm really passionate about this, right? But, you know, while we want people to go for their passions and live out their dreams, you know, what makes someone feel successful is validation. You know, we are social humans. Being able to serve others actually also serves ourselves and gives us our self-esteem and self-worth. You need to be validated by a third party. Now, Warby Parker has done this so beautifully. You've found your passion and you've also found a really need in the world. Tell us about that journey um, and how you knew that this was something the world needed. Yeah, you know, it's funny. We talk also a lot about where does somebody's passion and their skill sets overlap? Um, because, right, sometimes those don't, and it doesn't mean you can't pursue your passions, but maybe you don't pursue it professionally. And, yeah, and you prefer, that, that hobby. Yeah. I love playing the saxophone, but I'm not good enough to, um, to you know, uh, be a professional sax player. But, you know, at Warby, you know, we thought we were solving a real need here, right? This was something that we each experienced walking into an optical shop, getting excited about a pair of glasses and walking out feeling like we had been ripped off. Um, you know, prior to going to Wharton, I had spent five years running a nonprofit that would train low-income women in parts of rural El Salvador and Guatemala and parts of Sub-Saharan Africa and India and Bangladesh would train folks to start their own businesses, giving simple vision tests and selling glasses in their communities because there just weren't glasses available. And you can imagine if you can't see, you can't learn, you can't work. Um, so, you know, that was incredibly motivating because it was so rewarding, right? When you put on a pair of glasses on somebody for the first time and they can see and their eyes light up and their smile sort of erupts sort of ear to ear, um, that was amazing. Uh, but the thing that I also really enjoyed about it was sort of the mechanics and the operations of how do I make this work, right? You're effectively introducing a new product to a community where people aren't wearing glasses. How do you get people to trust that the, that the person selling the glasses is trustworthy, right? Like I, I would, you know, do trainings of, you know, low income women in, in some of these areas. And we focus on female entrepreneurs because the research showed that when women have access to capital, they tend to use on the health and education of their children. So there was this great multiplier effect. Um, but I remember training my first cohort of um, these entrepreneurs um, to sell glasses and they came back the next day and they said, Neil, um, you know, our neighbors didn't believe us. They said, hey, how, um, are you equipped to sell glasses? You didn't move into the capital city and go to school. Um, and one of the things that we realized is, oh, we need to credentialize people. So we started creating ID cards and training certificates and lab coats that were branded. Um, and right, there was no playbook on how to do that, but it was something that I was figuring out along the way based on real-time information, how do we adjust? Um, and sometimes also we found that these entrepreneurs had 
more success going into neighboring villages where maybe they didn't know a lot of people. Um, and they could introduce themselves not as, you know, the person that I grew up next door to, but as a, we call them asesoras visuales, um, vision advisors. Um, and they would give a uh, simple vision test and, you know, they could introduce themselves in, in this manner. Um, so those were the types of problems that I needed to solve on the ground. Um, and that translated right into Warby Parker, right? Entrepreneurship is just, right? How do you create a plan? How do you do constantly just check off box after box learning and, and applying along the way? That's so interesting. You know, cause we, you know, we're having the same issue. We tell students about this opportunity and they're like, that can't be real. <laughs> that can't be right. I'm supposed to wait. I'm supposed to write tons of essays. I'm supposed to be in student debt for the rest of my life. There can't be like a way. Of... So a lot of these things though, um, you learn by experience. Like you wouldn't have known that by any means that these people wouldn't have been trustworthy until on the ground. Definitely. So, Definitely. Well, um, one thing that we're really excited about, you brought credentialing. Now, this is something I'd love to talk to you about as a hiring manager. Now, you know, the, high, the degree, the traditional college degree is under scrutiny by loads of people, students, parents, the institution itself is even questioning what the next purpose future is. And you have like Google, Facebook coming in, the private sector saying, we, we know what we need, we know the skill sets, and we can train as well. So they're starting their own certifications. So we're seeing for the first time in decades, the end of the credentialing monopoly from the higher education institutions. Now, when you see these credentials, you know, a student who comes or someone who's applying per se and didn't go for the four year degree, but got a credential in marketing, right? A specific skill set. How, how are you guys feeling towards this new type of education that's coming out of the woodwork that's cheaper and more accessible? Yeah, I, we're, we're excited about it. Um, and when we talk to candidates, right, very rarely am I asking, hey, uh, what does your degree say? Right. I'm asking, hey, tell me about a time when you solved a problem. Tell me about a time where you faced um, an issue with a coworker. Tell me about a project that you worked on that failed. Um, and why, right? And I'm looking for specific experiences, but I'm also looking for maturity and uh, a person that has demonstrated, right, that they can work in a specific in environment. You know, frankly, one of the things that we also screen out for um, is, uh, you know, folks with an ego or folks that, um, you know, may have an inflated sense of self um, because so all work is collaborative and requires teamwork. And what can, you know, prevent effective teamwork, right? It's usually interpersonal dynamics and a lot could be, um, you know, come from folks that, you know, think that they shouldn't be doing a, a certain task or what have you. So at times, right, we look at folks that, are coming from elite institutions, right? The more traditional Ivies, and I know that I um, uh, might be speaking out both sides of my mouth because I went to, to Wharton for graduate school, but we'll scrutinize some of those resumes even more closely to make sure that there's not an unrealistic expectation of that candidate for how quickly they can rise within Willoughby Parker because they went to one of those elite institutions. What I'm hearing though is that it's so important for experience. And that's one of the things that school doesn't really sometimes make room for. Although the business school model does it beautifully, right? That was an opportunity where you got to do group work. Yeah. And, you know, actually working for several years before going back to school, right? That made that experience so much richer. And we also learned as much from our classmates as we did from our professors because everybody had a unique and interesting professional background coming in. You know, whether it was somebody who was a professional athlete, whether it was someone like me that worked in nonprofit, whether it was somebody that had worked in finance, whether it was somebody who had started a business, what have you. That diversity is so needed. Well, I'm going to ask one last question because I love and adore them so much. So talking to Griffin and Gemma, your kids, 
what would you, what are you, you know, you're the parent, you have dreams. What are you hoping for them and their educational journey? I hope that they discover what they're passionate about and also start to figure out what they're interested in. So that way they can pursue and, and just areas of interest for them and to just be happy at the end of the day. Um, and it was really exciting um, to hear Gemma recently in her class, they were talking about artists and covered Frida Kahlo and she was just so excited and actually wanted to dress up as Frida Kahlo and it was just really um, amazing. Uh, to to see that and right and she's five years old or or anybody. I bet Rachel got that costume going. I, I want to see these pictures soon. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> I know Halloween's going to be like that. Got it. Uh, well, Neil, such a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. You know, so many people are inspired by the Warby Parker mission, and you know, there's people behind it like you that are just trying to unite your passion with what the world needs. So, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. So that was Neil. I, what I think I'm taking away from that is the importance of experience and getting out there and the only way to find your passion so that you know the why behind those classes. Look, because he knew he was able to take his learning to the next level. So get out there. Um, we have more exciting guests coming up later this week. So thank you for tuning in.